Oh my god. <laughs> That's such a loaded question. Um and on the opening paragraphs of the sense of music, he talks about how now there's this big disparity between the musician and the audience. And perhaps even the first week, we tried to figure out what it means that a point is that which has no breath. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of The College. My name is Jordan, and on today's episode, I'll be discussing what it is like to be a part of the theater group on campus. Before we begin our conversation, this episode was recorded in December of 2020, and the King Williams Players reading of Plato Symposium that we discuss in this episode is available on the St. John's Digital Archives. I hope you enjoy this episode. To start, I just want to say thank you again for hopping on. Uh, would you be able to just say like who you are, what year you are, um, just a little bit about you? Yeah, um, I'm Ellie Lobs. I am a junior. Um, I come from Boston, Massachusetts, which although it's far-ish from Annapolis, kind of has a similar vibe. Um, other relevant things. I'm the Archon of KWP and the St. John's Chorus, and I'm a lab assistant, and that's what I do. <laughs> Just for the people that may not know, KWP is... Uh... The King William Players. It's our resident theater group. Ooh, resident theater group. Okay. That sounds cool. But really quickly, you said something about Boston. How is it? I've never been, so I'm very, I don't know what Boston is like, but I do know what Annapolis is like. How are they similar? You were saying like. Boston, I mean, it's, it's a historic town because of the American Revolution and all that stuff, but it's mostly just got the same like cobblestones, old buildings. Um, it's very small, but it kind of feels bigger from the inside in a way. So there definitely is something when I go to Annapolis where I'm like, oh, th this seems right. And, um... That's really cool. No, I, I, Boston is one of those cities that I want to like visit one day. Just haven't, and I don't think right now is a great time to, but you know. Sometime, come on yeah, over. Exactly, exactly. I think it'd be a cool place to like study at some point. You got a lot of great colleges there, but you also have some really great colleges in Annapolis, namely St. John's. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Famous plug, what can I say? Um, so you said King Williams Players, uh, KWP, you have St. John's course and your lab assistant. It's like a lot to be doing in a year. You're telling how, me. Yeah. How are you, I guess, before we get into everything, like how are you guys, or what are you doing for those, well, the two clubs and then one class? Like how, how is that structured this year? It's a little hard online. I mean, I'll start with the most boring one, which is probably St. John's Chorus, because you really can't sing together online. Um, and Mr. Cole Cavage, who's the, the conductor of the chorus, and I have talked a good deal about it. And I think we all miss it a lot, but there's really just not much to be done at the moment. Um, but for the King William Players, we've been doing a bunch of play readings this year every few weeks. So anyone from the community can come read a part. And it's not exactly something that's rehearsed or anything like that, but just the ability to really tell a story with other people there um, is kind of fun. It keeps it going in a way. And then we're also, the big thing we're doing is we still have our, our lecture slot this year, which is always in early December, we do a show instead of a Friday night lecture. So we are preparing a rehearsed Zoom reading of Plato's Symposium. So that's in the works. Watch out, December 11th, be there. I'll definitely request off from work because that's usually like Friday or Saturday. I'm always working, but um, I think that'd be really cool. Uh, it you, should be a good time. I don't know. I'm hopeful. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I that's I. Funny enough, you say symposium. I wrote my freshman paper on the symposium. Me too. <laughs> right. Okay. What did you focus on? I focused on Aristophanes' speech, and my my loose question was whether or not Aristophanes thinks love actually makes us feel whole. Mm. What about you? <laughs> yeah, no, I wrote on Aristophanes as well. Um, I don't think I knew how to write really freshman year. You know, yeah, it is what it is. But I, I, thinking back, I don't know what my question was. I was just really struck by the the idea of love, and I wanted to write about it. You know, being the the young freshman that I was. I mean, I'm not much older, but you know, the program I've gone through. I'd say majority of it now, um, which is crazy to think. But yeah. I think it was a poorly written essay, but you did pub, 
like published something about the symposium recently, right? Yeah, it's, that was an edited version of my freshman essay actually. Um, but it was kind of cool because it's in like a real literary magazine and it was nice and affirming to, to realize that some of the thoughts I have and the ways we're taught to put them in St. John's have like actual value because sometimes our community and like way of talking feels very insular, you know? Congratulations to you. That's really, that's sick. Um, December 11th, that'll be fun. Uh, so King Williams players, like if you guys weren't online, what are the types of things that you guys do? What is kind of like, not the motto, but like, who are you guys? What do you do? So we usually put on about four plays a year ish. And then this weird thing called too much light that happens generally every winter, which is a series of sketches that students write. Um, they're usually very funny. There's a whole evening about it, but most of it is the shows and they're all student directed, which is kind of cool and fun and not the norm at other colleges. And usually a lot of them are program based, like we did Fed and the Bacchae last year. And were we gonna, oh yeah, we had planned to do Antigone this year, although that's not happening since we're not on campus. But part of what I've been pushing for since I got elected Harkon is to really like bring other kinds of theater that I think resonate with the kinds of questions we like to ask at St. John's, but maybe are things people don't already know because there's just so much good stuff out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but that's the basic overview. We rehearse for shows, we put on shows, start rehearsing for another one. So they're all student run. Um, I don't, one thing that you said is like you talk, you try to touch on questions that we ask in class. And I think it's really interesting because I went to the Bacchae and I really liked it. Um, it was really well done. I think you were, uh, one of the is it directors yeah i assistant directed that one um, yeah like and it was jack condy who we love the jack condy the jack freshman year no yeah freshman year all right sorry i'm getting my freshman and sophomore year mixed up but yeah he was my he's a great guy great guy um but when you go about directing a play i find it interesting how do you touch on these these questions that we ask or that we ask in class like or how do you yeah what's the the mindset behind it all yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a tricky question. Maybe I'll use the Bacchae as an example here. Um, but one of the things Jack and I were thinking a lot about when we put it up is like what it means to really get what you desire and not have it work out for you. Um, and I think that's the role that Pentheus plays in the Bacchae most prominently. He really wants to know what's going on with these women. He really wants to get Dionysus out of the city. Um, and he sort of gets it, but it obviously ends very poorly. He, he's beheaded. Um, so some of the ways in which we tried to highlight that particular kind of question is one, you know, we had a very, I guess what some might say, like over-sexualized Dionysus. So the notion of desire was kind of implicit, um, but you can also do a lot with the staging. So like where we place Pentheus on the stage and what kinds of lines receive more or less emphasis can sort of highlight a, a through line in the show. And I think it's not just that that's a, fun gimmick we're playing to make things more St. John'sy. I think that's really what it is to be a good director, to like to have a particular perspective on a show and then to uh, illustrate that perspective to the audience in your rendition. Because otherwise, why, why are you doing it? People have seen the show before millions of times, right? So there's got to be something about your take that's relevant and important. You would know better than I would. Uh, but I think the, the show is really well but um, one of the things that stood out to me, and it's like a very, very small detail, but I thought it was really cool is uh, how there was one specific moment, I forget when it was, but like the room just turned really red. And I was like, oh snap, like, that's really cool. And I remember taking pictures, I have pictures uh, from the uh, play and it was just like, it was really red. Not even like, like it was, I don't know. That's one thing that really stuck out, but like, as a director or co-directing, how do you go about, because this is student run, so like, and I don't know why I'm, I'm like focusing on that. I just find it really interesting that like you guys don't really have outside help, um, which is pretty impressive when you guys are putting on the amount of plays you put on in a year. Um, but that being said, when you're directing, you have to reach out 
to the community or the, the St. John's community. And those are the people that you, you choose to fill in roles. So how does that whole process work? Do you, is it open to everyone or do you have to be as like, I don't know. Yeah, it's open to anyone. And actually, weirdly enough, tutors used to be in a lot of the shows, although they haven't been since I've been there or in a while, as far as I can tell. Um, but we hold auditions usually maybe a month before we start rehearsing for the show, which anyone can come to. I think GIs are welcome to, although I haven't seen many of them in my time. Um, and usually what happens, I mean, it varies based on the director, but as people will come and like read through a scene that's in the play, the director will take some notes and see like who fits best together and then put together a cast list. The audition process itself is fairly relaxed. I think the only weird thing about it is that, you know, you're being judged and directed by your peers essentially. And that's always a, a weird line to walk. I sat in one uh, audition like round. It was for, it was last year. It was right before spring break when like everything went to the flames where, you know, we weren't coming back, but uh, it was Charlie Carpenter was thinking of putting on a show. And oh, right, Zoo Story, right? Isn't that what he was gonna I do? I believe, I yeah. believe. And he had like four or five people come in, um, just cite some uh, some lines of their favorite plays or something like that. Um, and it's interesting. There wasn't, I don't know. I, I have this idea of like what it is like to be in the theater world. Um, I guess based off of like the very little involvement I had in high school. Uh, and it just seemed like it was kind of, it was stressful at times. But what was interesting for when I sat in on the, the casting, uh, I don't know what, I'm like, process. Blocking. yeah, like the casting process, it wasn't very stressful. Like people just came in, it was, they were like chatting, like they were, you know, oh, how's this reading going? How's that reading going? But then like, they just did what they had to do. And I feel like maybe that's what it's like. Cause, and you'd be the person to ask if, I don't know, I'm just guessing, is there like this stress behind it? Or is it more just like, we, because we all read, uh, I mean, like a great deal of plays that like, it's just fun. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess stress is always there, but does that make any sense of like kind of yeah no i think it's definitely more relaxed and more fun at st john's than auditioning might be anywhere else in the world you actually i don't know if you know this about me or not but i i went to a different college before i came to st john's and i was a uh acting and directing major so i was like it, i was in full theater mode um and one thing you find about like auditioning in the quote unquote real world is it's much more stringent. There are very specific things that are expected of you. There are plenty of like incredibly talented people. Not that we don't have those at St. John's, but usually acting here is a, a fun side hobby as opposed to someone's entire life and training. But I think the, the substance of the audition is more or less the same what you're really delivering or you're, you're showing someone the best you can do to embody this character. And like, that's going to be the same anywhere. I didn't know you were a, an acting and director directing major, but I, I knew you came from a different college and I guess this kind of changes changing gears a little bit. Like what brought you from the acting and directing world to like come to St. John's and kind of focus more on classics and reading and questioning rather than, um, I guess like a more specific kind of way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a number of answers to that question, because obviously it was a tough choice to make, but maybe the one that's more relevant to this conversation might provide a nice segue, is that um, one of the big things you're taught when you are learning to act is that the people who are better actors are not thinking while they're on stage. Um, they are just reacting to what's in front of them. That's more or less what contributes to any kind of emotional authenticity on stage. Um, and I had been acting all through middle school, high school, like basically since I came out of the womb. And I always found it to be a really nice counterpart to like the life of the mind, I guess, as we might want to call it. Um, that, you know, all day I would think really hard about things and then I would go to rehearsal and I would not only not have to think, but specifically be told not to think. And I think it was a really nice counterpart to um, classes. To, to traditional study. 
but because I loved it so much um, in middle and high school, I thought it was all I wanted to do. And I ended up being incredibly bored and restless. And I missed really thinking about things and talking about things and having things be hard for me. I actually, like, I missed being challenged. Um, so that was a lot of the reason for the move. Like, I, while I still love theater very, very much, I couldn't deal with just that all the time. I think that's, like, an interesting interesting thing about St. John's is like there's so uh, you know we only have like 500 students on campus but everyone has their own interests and it only takes one person to really uh, provide an outlet for anyone else that may I don't know may be interested or they know what it is but they've never done it before and then they can try it out and uh, like theater is one of them it is something that the college has had for a number of years, but it still serves the same kind of purpose where there each and every year there are multiple people that are interested in not only interested, but passionate about acting and maybe some that aren't, but they've never done it and they want to do it that, you know, that brings them out. Um, and that's just like, it's interesting. And it's really nice kind of to have that type of environment because I don't know, I'm speaking as if I, I've done these things, but I, I really haven't. But I'm just thinking of all the different kind of clubs or activities that, that we have for such a small campus. It's like amazing that you could, I believe it was freshman year, like you, you would be rehearsing for a play, but then I'd see you out on like the soccer field on a Saturday or something like that. Like you're all, people aren't set in one or, or they're not, not set in a particular direction, but they're not like bound to be in one area of the college they can move around and I think that kind of says a lot of like about us is we're not we don't do just one thing we're always kind of moving always kind of progressing in some sort of way and then the goal is after trying a couple of things out you kind of figure okay maybe I like this one thing over something else maybe I'll spend a little bit more time and sacrifice uh, sports or sacrifice fencing or sacrifice drama or whatever, or singing to pursue any other thing that they really enjoy. But um, yeah. that's, always, that's always, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I, th I think that's right. I think we, we all work really hard at the college. Um, and I think we all need an outlet. Um, and I think actually one of the really nice things about the way extracurriculars function for us is that, or, I don't know if this is true or not, but this does seem to be my opinion is that, you know, one of the reasons I did a lot of intramurals my freshman year and some last year as well, is that I didn't feel a pressure to be excellent. Um, I'm sure you saw me on the soccer field, like I'm, I'm no soccer star in the making, but I felt like I was allowed to genuinely try it out. Um, and I think the same is true for, for drama as well. Like, I don't think there's an expectation of excellence. There is an expectation of hard work, um, but nobody's expected to be anything in particular. And I think that's primarily because we all need a kind of catharsis in whatever extracurricular activities we're engaging in. And we kind of allow ourselves to have that. I don't know, that might be two broad strokes of you, but. No, yeah, I think that's right. And I wonder what, like where that stem, like why do we need an outlet? But then the only thing that kind of ties me to that thought is just the amount of work that we do. Um, I don't know, at, at any given point, you're at least reading four different kind of works. You have your math, you have your lab or music, you have language, and you have seminar. Those are like, you know, the core classes of St. John's, and you're not reading the same thing throughout that. And it gets frustrating sometimes. And if you don't, at least from, from speaking personally, if I don't have an outlet, I will just go crazy because it's like, yeah. What do I do with all of this? Like sometimes you just got to say, screw it. I'm going to go outside or screw it. I need to go hang out with friends and act something out. I, I know. Ooh, so it was, it was the end of sophomore year. There was a, a good, or I guess the middle of sophomore year when we were doing Shakespeare, a good number of uh, students would get together that were like maybe in the same seminar and they would read through the play because it made it a little bit more enjoyable, not as dry because when you're reading something like that, it's supposed to be acted out. You're not supposed to just sit there and I'd say philosophize about, I don't know, who is a uh, Falstaff, right? But 
Right, there's something different that happens when it enters into your own voice. And I think Shakespeare in particular is such a good example because he didn't write to be read. Um, and I think there is a lot to glean from reading him. I, I love it dearly, but there really is something that happens when you engage like the muscles of your body to, to figure out what a text is in a very literal way. Um, and I think you get at the humanity of it more when you're trying to, to put yourself into these characters. So with Shakespeare in particular, I, th I think it works very well for us. Shakespeare was hard, like, that's very hard. A lot, very dense, um, and we do a lot, I'd say, in a short amount of time. Um, we spend like a good portion of second semester, our sophomore year, just working through many of his plays. And I think, I mean, I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm no, it's not my strong suit, but I definitely enjoy it. But I do kind of want to turn towards, uh, music and singing at the college because we are at the time where we would be uh collegium would be near right every year we have i mean maybe if you want to talk about what collegium is you've been a part of it in a diff different way than i have but if you would like to share some thoughts of yeah um collegium i mean i've never organized it so you might get a different perspective from one of those people but it's essentially it's a holiday celebration at the end of first semester and then a spring celebration again at the end of the second semester. And like functionally, it's sort of like a talent show. Um, anyone can sign up and, and share something with the community. It mostly ends up being a lot of musical groups. So you'll get the, the orchestra, the chorus, the contemporary choir, and then some solo people. Um, I find it really delightful. It always ends with a, a performance from the, the St. John's Chorus, which is what I've done each year. Um, and then we all carol together for, for the fall collegium. And I think there's just something really lovely about getting together and listening to the talents of our peers and then sort of combining in a homogenous, though by no means unprofound way at the end where we all sing Secret Chervus, the big St. John song. What yeah. The, sorry. No, go. <laughs> I was just gonna say, what is it about singing then? That like, it's very central to the college. And what is it about that? Um, I mean, every, if we were in person, every Wednesday, you have uh, the secret sing and the pendulum pit. You have things like collegium, you have performances by uh, bands that come together at the college that could be on like any reality party or something like that. Um, so music is central to the college. And we even, like I said, we, we spend a year dedicated to focusing on that. And yeah, what is it about music? I think I'd have graduated already if I could really answer that question, but I will tell you my favorite fun fact about singing in particular, which is that when you are singing in a chorus, everyone's heartbeats sync up. Um, it's a biological fact. So your heart will be pumping at the exact same pace as not only the person next to you, but the person five rows behind you in the great hall. Um, so there is something really deeply and fundamentally human about what goes on when we sing together. I think part of the question of of the sophomore music tutorial is well like why is that the case like what is music actually doing for us not just in terms of the specific emotional response that an individual piece elicits but music seems to do something fundamentally connective um for for people and I I think we sense that like I think that's why I enjoy singing although I I can't say I could explain it to you <laughs> you got me thinking again <laughs> early sophomore year man you know I so one of the prerequisites to even get to sophomore year is that you have to pass um this music notation quiz I took it maybe like five times I'm not exaggerating I was ter like I'm terrible I didn't understand honestly like how notes work what a scale was you know I know I thought I knew what an octave was but I really didn't um but then getting into to sophomore year, you know, there's this like appreciation of music that I didn't think I would have because of the real, like, like you said, the real human aspect where we're all, we all share music in some sort of way, right? We all, it's all, it's a part of our life. We find at least some sort of rhythm in walking. Um, yeah, that's the best example that I have. I was going to say like the trees brushing against one another, but that's not really rhythm, but like, yeah, I, I 
don't know how to get at uh, the question of like why music or, but I do, I don't know where I'm going, but I, I do see the appreciation of it. And I guess what, what kind of messing my words up, but like, and when you have a group like you do for St. John's Chorus, where you kind of like an extended version of freshman chorus or even sophomore music, like what is that? I'm wondering what kind of, like what does that environment bring to one, like one's personal self? Like, do you still, I don't know, is there some sort of enjoyment? I mean, of course, probably if you're committed to singing, but I don't know, what, what does that community do for you as a person that is involved in the college? I mean, I think on the, the basic level, it connects you to other people. It gives you somewhere to go. I think we like habit. We like routine. Um, but I, I was even thinking as you were talking that there's definitely a reason why music takes the place of lab sophomore year, um, because I, I, I think it really is a, a science class in a certain way. And so far as like, on the one hand, there's the dreaded music notation exam and a lot of the music theory that we do all sophomore year. And then on the other hand, like there's the thing itself and the way it makes you feel. I think it's in a lot of ways analogous to what we do with the heart dissection freshman year. You're looking at this big cow heart and you can chart out what's going on with the ventricles and what way the blood is flowing and how it's put together. You know, you, you learn enough about that from Harvey and Galen. But then there's also this thing that happens where you realize I'm holding a heart that kept something else alive. And like, I also have one of those that ostensibly looks the same, like right here. Um, and I think music has that duality too, because I can tell you what's going on with the rhythm, what the intervals are, I can dissect it. But the thing we're really interested in accounting for is the kind of emotional response that occurs. Um, and I can't tell you I know how to do that yet. But I think that's also part of what makes me want to uh, continue to sing and like make it part of my life at St. John's is to sort of continue to, to poke at that question of like, why do I feel something when I look at the heart? Um, why do I feel something when I sing Seacoot with people for the 80 millionth time? Even that 80 millionth time is still something that like will 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 catch you. Um, I get a lot like sitting in class, I have a very good idea of the time passing. Sometimes because I want it to pass a little bit quicker than it is. Others because time has gone by very quickly. But I have an idea of what time is. But when it comes to music, when it comes to singing, especially my perception, my idea of time goes out of the window. And I'm just totally in the music. Uh, and that sounds very weird and very like maybe even meta, but like it's something that you you really do have to experience just to be able to understand because there is not, I mean, the thing that I remember vividly is uh, com or yeah, convocation our freshman year when the upperclassmen would sing Siku Chair, but uh, they'd like, I guess, invite us to the college by singing Siku Chair. Um, I was like, moved maybe a strong word, but I was definitely touched. I was like, that's really nice. Um, I've never, the closest thing I had to that was like an alma mater at like my high school or whatever, but it never gets old to sing. And I think you're on to something when you say like, there's a way of dissecting and a way of appreciating and kind of understanding what it, what that human connection or, yeah, you, you're like opening my mind back up to many of the questions we asked sophomore year and it's just something that I don't know like I don't know why music is so central but I can see for me one of the central things that St. John's does is that it invites you to try to do something and if you don't like it okay fine you tried it but if you do it's something that I think will stick with you for the rest of your life because it's, you know singing like I said is all, always around um, but I wanted to ask maybe some advice to anyone that is uh, maybe joining the St. John's community or, or working their way through the, the program. And 
music is something that could be overlooked. Um, friends of mine, not many, but there are definitely some that looked beyond music saying, ah, this is a class that I have to do. I was told I need to do this as a requirement. Um, but why take it seriously? What happens when you can take music seriously? There's this quote, and I'm kicking myself because I can't remember who said it, but I'm going to use it anyway, and maybe your listeners can Google this. I don't know. Um, but that art is how we decorate space, but music is how we decorate time. Um, and I, I, I had heard this before even coming to St. John's, but this idea that time is a thing that can be decorated was really compelling to me. I think you were touching on this a little bit in, in how you feel sitting in class, that there is a notion of how time is passing. But the idea that I can decorate it well or decorate it poorly or that there's some kind of agency I have in the, the aesthetic quality of my time, um, I think speaks very well to music. I think that's one of the most obvious ways we can decorate time because you have a piece and it is set to a rhythm and you are putting these, these notes, these harmonies um, kind of on, on the time fabric of, of your life. But I, I think that notion is true as well to the other sorts of things we've been talking about, sports, theater, um, different classes. Those are also, I think, ways of decorating one's time. And one of the things that kind of keeps me up at night in a good way is this question of like whether or not I'm decorating it well. Um, and I think kind of having that cognizance while you're at St. John's is really important because you have so many options for, for what to do with it. And I think it really is your responsibility to make sure that it's well decorated. When talking about decorating time, this, this is making me think of a fun question of, is there good and bad music for one soul? Hmm. Right? Like um, my, I was lucky enough to have Mr. Calcavage as my music tutor. Um, feel very, very lucky. Um, but we were talking one day about like modern music and modern music to him is very different from modern music to say like us sitting, like the, the students sitting in the class. And he was like, oh yeah. Uh, to me, modern music is like, I don't know, listen to the radio. Any one of those songs I'd say is modern. Um, unless you're listening to a specific channel that has a specific kind of uh, time period or whatever. Um, but the point is some of that modern music, namely some hip hop, I, I'd say is not, depending on how you want to define good in the sense, good for your soul. I was just wondering, do you think there is music that is or is not? I think that's a hard question, yeah. Mr. West. Because um, I don't I don't know exactly how to ascribe a kind of moral binary to music with regards to the soul. And like, I don't know that I'm equipped to either. I think I certainly have taste and there's certainly music I would say is worse than others. I don't know that I can ascribe that universally or not, but listening to something like, you know, Box Goldberg variations versus listening to, I don't know, Kesha, right? Like, I think Bach is definitely doing something for me that Kesha is not. Um, but I'd be really hard pressed to tell you exactly why that is, except that, you know, what one seems to have more, more thought. Um, I do wonder if part of it is that now we have more ways of making music. It's been electronicized, which I think is part of the problem. I think once we make it artificial in a way, it feels like it's further from being good for our soul. Mm -hmm. um, you got me I, No, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, you got me thinking, I, I don't know this specific piece that you're bringing up about, uh, or box specific piece, but I do know Kesha. <laughs> and I know there's words involved in her music. And I'm wondering, is there a difference between the words that are being said and the melodies or the, the tones that are involved? Um, I'm wondering what hits to the human and why, right? Like, is it the words or is it the tones? Is it the movement? the movement of music more or less? 
I think it has to be in a way. And it's not to say that the words can't be moving, but I think you're into a whole nother set of questions once you have music that does have words, because then you're asking to what degree does the instrumentation and vocalization fit the thing that's being talked about? There has to be this kind of correspondence between the text and the music. Um, like l last year in St. John's Chorus, for example, we did three settings of O Mangu Mysterium, which is a, a particular set of text. We did one by Victoria, one by Pulenk, and one by Yalo, I think. Um, so it was the same words, but it was set very differently in each case. And I actually, I wrote a music essay last year on how I thought that Poulenc's setting of the text was far superior to the other ones because he's doing something with his instrumentation that seems evocative of, of what's being spoken about. Um, but I think that's more of a tangent to your probably more profound question about like what it is that's actually provoking something within us. Um, and I think it's gotta be some kind of combination. Like you need a very specific ratio to set off a chemical reaction. I think there's a similar kind of ratio with music, but I don't know exactly what it is. So could you say more a little bit about this? Wait, I just, this ratio to set off a chemical reaction. What, what is the rate you were? I mean, I, I was just thinking about how, you know, and you would have this experience in freshman lab, probably when you're combining two chemicals, sometimes if you do too little of one or too much of another, they're not gonna either combine or change color or whatever you're trying to have happen in the right way. So you need this very specific proportion of one thing to the other thing in order to achieve a result. And I guess I'm wondering if our emotional response to pieces of music is a similar kind of result that I'm gonna have some combination of, of rhythm and interval and harmony and maybe text and they all have to be set together in a specific proportion um, in order to elicit that emotional response. Maybe that's too clinical of a way to go about it. I'm not sure, but I feel like there's gotta be a way to account for all the elements of music in the response that they elicit. Yeah, that sounds, I'm, I'm sorry, when you first brought that up, I was thinking more of like a biological mm. kind of thing where like you need like maybe a certain kind of experience, a certain kind of uh, smell, taste will set off some sort of uh, chemical reaction in your head saying, ooh, I like, or ooh, I don't like. Um, and that made me think about, well, is music somehow doing the same? Um, we have been talking a lot about music and we could go on for, I think, honestly, for hours because music is such an inter interesting thing, but I do want to touch a little bit broader or, or, or expand out to maybe the, I want to expand out to like St. John's as a whole and kind of ask you what, what over these past couple of years that you're a junior now, so you've been here not quite three years yet, but almost, um, what have been some things that have caught your attention that maybe you wouldn't expect or that you, you've you always found interesting that St. John's has allowed you to, I don't know, maybe pursue a little bit more? And mm -hmm. I apologize for talking so much, but I, I want to just preface this. I'm not trying to do this to ask why St. John's is so important or special. It's more of like when you get a group of like-minded individuals together and then you have the guidance that, that I'd say most tutors, I can't say all, but most tutors will guide you in such a way that you come to question in such a way that allows your curiosity to flourish and pushes you to within yourself to investigate whatever it is, namely, say, I don't know, Plato or Schopenhauer or music or whatever. Um, I think one of the, the reasons I came here as opposed to anywhere else, um, and a reason that didn't disappoint is this, this thought that I think is implicit in the fact that we regard, um, science and mathematics as though they're humanities in a way, um, that math is just as capable of answering the, who are we, why are we here? What is here sorts of questions that literature or philosophy might be. And I think that that's an incredibly seductive idea. And it's much easier in thought than in practice. 
but I think we do it well. I hope we do it well. I mean, I failed chemistry in high school um, and I'm now a lab assistant. And maybe part of that's because I really like proving people wrong. But I think the other part of it is that I really found a way in um, to science that I hadn't experienced before I got here. That, you know, when you're looking at a, a tree or a fish, I guess in freshman lab, um, you really are answering the question of like, what does it mean for something to be alive? And while I think it's exhausting to take oneself that seriously all the time, the, the idea that anything I read could just as well be a springboard for those questions and those answers, I think is really compelling to me and seems to me something that most people at the college practice. Um, I know that's not totally a sufficient answer and now I'm sort of forgetting the broader question, but. But no, maybe we'll, we'll uh, close it out here and I just wanna say thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, of course. We must remember the times that we're living in. It's yeah, I think that's true. And my hope is, maybe I'll try to end us on a more optimistic note, that in some ways, like the weird circumstances under which we're trying to address these big questions mm -hmm. might lead to ways in which we can begin to answer them that might not have otherwise occurred to us. Thank you for listening to this episode of The College. Stay tuned for our newest episode next week.